Hey everybody, my name is Ben Fountain, um, and I really like all my fellow finalists. Um, uh, we had a nice hour, you know, visiting across the street at the bar. You can usually find writers at bars. Um, uh, I wrote a book called Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk. It, um, it takes place over the course of one Thanksgiving day at Texas Stadium. Um, uh, the Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys always play one of the two NFL games televised on Thanksgiving Day. Um, uh, it follows eight American soldiers, Bravo Squad, uh, over the course of this one day. They, they're being honored um, as a special guest at this football game. And um, the title character, Billy Lynn, is 19 years old. Um, and uh, he's, uh, he's from a small town in Texas. I'm going to read from a scene. Um, the soldiers are all down on the field before the game. They're going to tape a, uh, they're going to tape, record a Thanksgiving Day message to the nation. And um, but anyway, there's technical difficulties, and so they're just kind of hanging around, waiting for those to be resolved. And, uh, and it's cold and rainy, and they've been drinking. Now they can't drink, and um, so they're just kind of miserable. They're dying out here. Billy scoops up a football and flips it at Dom. Hit me, he barks. And without waiting to see if Dom actually catches the ball, Billy sprints off with an agonal ah, legs churning through all the arterial muck of the day's heavy intake of food and booze. Three, four steps, and his legs start to get it. His arms gear into the rhythm of the stride. He jukes through random people standing along the sideline, breaks left across the end zone, and looks back. The ball, shit, is right on him, tightly spinning like a drill bit's business end. And in that split second, he sees everything. Speed, loft, trim, computes to ETA, while his eye travels the ball's trajectory back to the source. The big bang of Sergeant Dime's arm and the suddenly animate genius of his snarling face, like a Viking leaping ashore with axe in hand. He's unloaded a real bullet, too. The ball sings like silk tearing along a seam, and Billy knows there will be no mercy in it. But he does just like the pros, eyes it all the way in and folds his stomach around the blow, a smothering oof, touchdown. He throws the ball back to Dom and angles deeper into the end zone, legs stroking, lungs feeding on, on fresh cold air. It feels so good to run, to just run. Dom leads him too far with the next pass and he has to stretch, full extension in mid-stride and hands. A cheer rises from the end zone stands as he pulls the ball in. And Billy breaks off a little touchdown dance. Uh-huh, uh-huh, taking it to the house. On the next pass, Dom waves him long, then launches a bomb that floats over Billy's head and into his arms, like rocking a baby the way that ball cuddles up to him. And the end zone crowd sends up another cheer. Billy is on. He's feeling it. There's a tingling sentience in every inch of his body. His receptors key to near orgasmic pitch with a corresponding sureness of motor control. Is this how professional athletes feel all the time? <clears throat> Such pleasure in the sheer physicality of every moment, the meaty spring of your feet off good firm turf, the razor strop of cold air in and out your lungs. Even food must have a heightened savoriness for them. And sex, dog, don't even talk about it. He pivots, plants his feet for the throw back to Dom and finds one, two, three footballs sailing at him, air support for an all-out incursion onto the field. Mango launches a line drive kick that screams past Billy's head. Lotus rams into Sykes from behind, knocking him to the ground. Crack and Abort go long for a pass from Day, elbowing and trash talking stride for stride. Stumbling, nearly falling, they are laughing so hard. Jerry Rice, Dime says as he jogs past Billy. Then he kicks into gear and goes streaking off, looking back for Billy's pass. The end zone crowd is really cheering now, and why not? What fan hasn't dreamed of doing this very thing? A hell all dash around the Valhalla of pro football fields. Bravo falls into a loose game of razzle-dazzle. Modified tackle the man with the ball with fluid or basically non-existent teams and no apparent goal. Just a bunch of guys tearing around the end zone, slamming into each other and, and laughing their asses off. And if it was just this, Billy thinks, just the rude, mindless, head-banging game of it, then football would be an excellent sport and not the bloated, sanctified, self-important beast it became once the culture got its clammy hands on it. Rules. There are hundreds, and every year they make more. 
an insidious and particularly gross distortion of the concept of play. And then there are the meat brain coaches with their sadistic drills and team prayers and dyslexia-inducing diagrams, the control freak refs running around like little Hitlers, the timeouts, the deadening pauses for incompletes, the pontifical ceremony of instant replay reviews, plus huddles, playbooks, pads, audibles, and all other manner of stupor, stupefactive device, when the truth of the matter is that boys just want to run, run around and knock the shit out of each other. This was a mystery Billy's mother was never able to fathom. After having two daughters, she couldn't, under, she couldn't accept why from the earliest age her son would purposely slam into walls, doors, shrubbery, wrestle the ottoman around the den, or spontaneously tumble to the ground for no apparent reason other than it is there. Football seemed a constructive outlet for this impulse, and at various times during his youth, Billy played organized ball. Organized being the code word for elaborate systems of command and control where every ounce of power resides at the top. It seemed that football must be made to be productive and useful, a net plus benefit for all mankind, hence the endless motiva motivational yawping about teamwork, sacrifice, discipline, and the other modern virtues, the basic thrust of which boiled down to shut up and do as you're told. So despite the terrific violence inherent in the game, a weird passivity seeped into your mind. All those rules, all the maxims, all the three-hour practices where you mostly stood around waiting your turn to be screamed at by an assistant coach, they produced an almost pleasurable numbness, a general dulling of perception and responsiveness. In a way, it was nice constantly being told what to do, except after a while it got boring as hell, and as, at a certain age you started to realize that most of the coaches were actually dumb as rocks. <laughs> Hello, Hassman. It's been great to meet these six people here, six, seven. Um, let's soak up some brilliance tonight. So I wrote Girl Child, and Girl Child's protagonist is Rory Dom, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Hope Chest. Here are two things of mine. A glass unicorn with golden hooves, the body broken in several pieces, and what looks like a broken necklace. Did I break these? I stroke the horse's thigh. This, yes, but the necklace, no. The necklace came to me like this, links with smooth, small pebbles and shades of underwater. Each stone has clasps of metal on its ends, or hardened bits of glue from where the clasps, once upon a time, connected. What is missing, what I do not have, is the letter that explains these stones and what it is I'm to do with them now. The letter was written from my grandma to me on a late Christmas, written on onion skin paper, as she always wrote, and in black felt tip, as she always wrote, with all of her usual underlines and emphasis. And I remember at least these words. These stones are like the women in our family, some disconnected, some lost, but each part of a greater chain and each beautiful in its own way. There were once many strands, but here are all that remain. It will be up to you to keep them together. I also know that these words were said better, so much better by Grandma Shirley Rose, but she's not here. What's here are these stones, this broken horse, stacks of letters and felt tip and onion skin, a tattered Girl Scout handbook, a welfare file copy from carbon paper, burnout votives, shotgun shells, tennis shoes, one green thumb, and me. My name is Rory Dawn Hendricks, feeble-minded daughter of a feeble-minded daughter, herself the product of feeble-minded stock. Welcome to the Kaye. Boomtown. Just north of Reno and just south of nowhere is a town full of trailers and the front doors of the dirtiest ones open on to the Calle. When the Calle de las Flores trailer park was first under development on the rum and semen stained outskirts of Reno, all of its streets were going to glow with the green of new money and freshly trimmed hedges and Spanish names that evoked the romance of the Old West. At the first curve off the I-395, a promise was erected of what was to come bold white letters against a gold background. Calle de las Flores, 
come home to the new west. But soon after the first sewer lines were laid down and the first power lines were run up, the investors backed out because the biggest little city in the world was found to be exactly that, too little. With its dry, harsh climate and harsher reputation, Reno could not support suburbs of a middle-class kind, and the new home buyers needed to make the Calle's property values thrive never arrived. Once the big money figured that out, the big money said adios, and Calle de las Flores ended before it begun. Broken in half during the first Sierra winter, what remains of the sign still stands at that first curve off the interstate. Warped by the weight of too much snow and disappointment, beat down by too many punches from the fists of Calle boys, the De Las Flores have scattered to the winds. All that's left to speak for the neighborhood that grew up around it is the word Calle, it's two Spanish elves asking why on a desert bleach sign. Stucco. Single wide, double wide. A house with a hitch. Single mom, gravel drive. Propane by the gallon, generic cigs by the carton, and solitaire round the clock. Cousins and animals multiply like cars in the front yard. Nothing around here gets fixed. The calle is not a through street. The road is paved with uncles, Smokey, Barney, Johnny Law, Pig. Uncles with their badges, with their belt buckles say, hey, sugar toots, sweet thing, is your mama home? Hand already through the already ripped screen door, finger on the latch. When you play solitaire, you're playing against the devil, the Calle grandmas say through false teeth, yellow teeth, broken teeth, through pink gums hidden behind hands, paws from stringing garlands of silver beer tabs. Hands that threaten to shuffle the spots off the cards, threaten to smack you so hard your no good daddy will fall out of bed if you don't stop interrupting the idiot box with your idiot mouth and see to that mess in the kitchen. 52 pickup. Suicide kings and one-eyed jacks face off on orange shag. Kaye girls cry uncle through clenched teeth and past his shoulder the sirens flash redneck blues across the white stucco, nicotine yellow ceiling. Thank you. How cool is it here, fiction read by the author? It's really great. Um, my name is Peter Heller. I wrote a book called The Dog Stars. I'm going to read um, three really short sections, and I've heard five minutes is a limit, so I'm going to try not to sound like the chipmunks at the end. Um, this takes place nine years after a super flu has killed 99.7% of the people on the planet. Uh, our hero lives at a little country airstrip north of Denver called Erie, and it's just, a, it's just a, an airstrip and some houses, and he lives with his dog Jasper, and a mean gun nut named Bangley who showed up a few months after everything fell apart. And uh, Hig is a man who's lost everything. He, he lost his wife who was seven months pregnant with her first child. And um, I should just tell you, that he, he sleeps outside every night even though he can sleep in a house because it makes him too sad to sleep in a house. Now I don't have to sleep on the ground. We have our system, we are confident. The fear is like a memory of nausea. You can't remember how bad it was or that you just about asked to die instead. But I do sleep on the ground. Under a pile of blankets in winter that must weigh 20 pounds, I like it, not boxed in. I still sleep behind the berm. I still leave the porch light on. Jasper still curls against my legs, still dreams and whimpers, still trembles under his own blanket but I think he is mostly deaf now and useless as an alarm, which we will never let on to Bangley. Bangley, you just don't know with him. He harbors, might resent the meat I share, who knows, the way he sees it, everything has a use. I once had a book on the stars, but now I don't. My memory serves, but not stellar, ha. Huh. So I made up constellations. I made a bear and a goat, but Maybe not where they're supposed to be. I made some for the animals the one, that once were, the ones I know about. I made one for Melissa, 
her whole self standing there, kind of smiling and tall, looking down at me in the winter nights, looking down while frost crinkles in my eyelashes and feathers in my beard. I made one for the little angel. Melissa and I lived on a lake in Denver. Sometimes back then, fishing with Jasper up the sulfur, I hit my limit. I mean, it felt my heart might just burst. Bursting is different than breaking. Like there is no way to contain how beautiful, not it either, not just beauty, something about how I fit. This little bend of smooth stones, the leaning cliffs, the smell of spruce, the small cutthroat making quiet rings in the black water of a pool, and no need to thank even, just be, just fish, just walk up the creek, get dark, get cold. It is all of a piece of me somehow. Melissa part of the same circle, but different because we are entrusted <laughs> with certain souls. Like I could hold her carefully in my cupped hands, like to bear her carefully, carefully, the country I cannot, but her I can, and maybe all along it was she holding me. The hospital St. Vincent's was right across the lake. The orange helicopters landed there. At the end, we talked about flying west, but it was too late and there was a hospital. We went to the hospital to one of the buildings. They took over, filling with the dead. Jasper used to be able to jump up into the cockpit. Now he can't. In the fourth year, we had an argument. I took out the front passenger seat for weight and cargo and put down a flannel sleeping bag with a pattern of a man shooting a pheasant over and over, his dog on three legs pointing out in front. Uh, this is a, a little airplane that Hig flies on a patrol. Not sure why I didn't do that before. The dog doesn't look like Jasper still. I carried him, lay him on the pattern of the man and his dog. You and me in another life, I tell him. He likes to fly anyway. I wouldn't leave him alone with Bangley. When I took out the seat, he got depressed. He couldn't sit up and look out. He knows to stay back at the rudder pedals. Once in a shear, he skidded into them and nearly killed us. After that, I fashioned like a four-inch wood fence, but scrapped it after he inspected it and jumped out of the plane and, like, refused to fly. No shit. It insulted him. The whole thing. I used to worry about the engine roar and prop blast. I wear the headset, even though there's no one to talk to on the radio, because it dampens the noise. But I worried about Jasper. Even tried to make him his own hearing protector, this helmet kind of thing, but it wouldn't stay on. Probably why he's mostly deaf now. When I picked up oil, etc., I moved the quilt to the top of the stack so he could look out. See, I said, at least it's good half the time, better than most of us can expect. He still thought it was lame, I could tell, not half as excited. So now when I'm not picking up, just flying, which is most of the time, I bolt the seat back in. It just takes a few minutes, not like we don't have time. First time he sat up straight again and glanced at me like, what took you so long? Then looked forward, real serious, brow furrowed like a co-pilot. His mood it lifted, palpable as weather. He's getting old. I don't count the years. I don't multiply by seven. They bred dogs for everything else, even diving for fish. Why didn't they breed them to live longer, to live as long as a man? And I'm just going to end with um, a cozy apocalyptic scene. <laughs> Um, I think one critic called this a po cozy apocalyptic story. <laughs> I don't think he did the body count, I don't know. Uh, the afternoon was fine, with just a slight breeze stirring off the mountains, warm in the sun, but almost winter cold in the shadow of the hangar. I had the wood stove going and the kettle on, steaming. I made tea from a jar of summer flowers, leaves that I dried, wild strawberry, black raspberry, mint, and sat in Valdez, the recliner I'd pulled out of the home entertainment room of one of the mansions. It was named after the Exxon tanker that had wrecked and spilled in Alaska. It was a split double recliner for husband and wife, presumably, but now for me and Jasper, with a lever on each side and covered in the finest calfskin, it was very soft. I put an heirloom quilt on his side, patched with prints and blues and yellows, and with a repeating pattern of a log cabin made from squares and triangles and printed cloth, every piece different, but with the same twist of smoke coming out of each chimney, paisley or polka dot or ribbed with color, 
So it gave an impression of a fanciful village evenly spread over a country of geometric fields and flowering crops. And at a retiring hour when everyone was indoors enjoying the warmth of a fire, as we were. It was comforting to look at and comfortable sitting in the deep chair and the waves of heat from the stove levered halfway back and drinking tea. I could almost imagine that it was before that Jasper and I were off somewhere on an extended sojourn and would come back one day soon, that it would all would come back to me, that we were not living in the wake of disaster. He had not lost everything but our lives. Same as yesterday, standing in the garden, it caught me sometimes that this was okay, just this, that simple beauty was still bearable barely, and that if I lived moment to moment, garden to stove, to the simple act of flying, I could have peace. It was like I was living in a doubleness, and the doubleness was the virulent insistence of life and its blues and greens laid over the scaling grays of death, and I could toggle one to the other, step into and out of as easily as I might step into and out of the cold shadow of the hangar just outside, or that I didn't step, but the shadow passed over like the shadow of a cloud that covered my arm with goosebumps and passed. Life and death lived inside each other. That's what occurred to me. Death was inside all of us, waiting for warmer nights, a compromised system, a beetle, as in the now dying black timber on the mountains. Life was inside death, virulent and insistent as a strain of flu, how it should be. It was memory that threw me. I tried hard not to remember, and I remembered all the time. Thank you.